Well, hey, happy Easter Sunday to you all. It is such a joy and such a privilege, and it is such a blessing to be with you on this Easter Sunday. Amen. Uh, to those of you joining with us at home, so glad that you've joined us as well. You know, we were singing that Wazani Nonke song, and uh, for me, that takes me right back to Easter last year, where, of course, we were at home, and we had that amazing online Easter service, and we sang that song, and I remember, like, all Easter Sunday singing Wazani, yeah. Um, so it took me back there, and it was a really great Easter as it could have been online, but nothing compares to being able to be together, to share in celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ together. Amen. So on the behalf of Rosebank Union Church, all of us here, we really want to wish you and your families a most blessed Easter time. We've had a wonderful weekend of celebrating Easter together. We were determined to like make up for not doing stuff last year. So we had like 100 Easter services um, since Thursday night. I want to take the opportunity while I can to just really thank our staff and volunteers who've really made this Easter weekend just so special um, for us today. So thank you to them. So let's talk resurrection. So turn with me in your Bibles to uh, John chapter 11. We're going to take some time this morning to uh, walk pretty slowly through uh, what I think is a pretty well-known story um, and quite a, a lengthy story. So we're really going to go through it slowly. It's 44 uh, verses. We're going to have ourselves a good old Bible study this morning. You all sound fun? All three of us are going to have a good time uh, today. So if your Bible's out... Let's have a look at John chapter 11, and let's start by reading verse 1 to 3, kind of read and comment as we go. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to Jesus, saying, Lord... He whom you love is ill. So Jesus is currently with his disciples in a town uh, called Bethania. It's about 200 kilometers away from the town of Bethany where his friends Lazarus, Mary and Martha live and he receives word that, that Lazarus is sick. So it would have taken in those days a fit healthy man uh, about three or four days to have traveled there. So message gets to Jesus about Lazarus's illness. It must have been serious because for them to have sent somebody on that journey to have given Jesus, Jesus this message means that it was kind of dire straits um, for Lazarus. And so they send Jesus this message, um, not just because they believe he can do something about it, that he can help Lazarus, and of course he can. They've seen him heal many people. In fact, they've seen him raise people from the dead. At this point, Jesus had raised uh, the widow of Nain's son from the death and Jairus's daughter from the death. So they send message to Jesus to come and help, but it's not just for help. They're reaching out to him um, because it's it's quite clear that he loves them, that they're close to this family. Uh, they write in their notes, Lord, he whom you love is ill, which is curious. You know, why not just say, hey, Jesus, Lazarus is sick, but describing he whom you love is ill, which is kind of a feature of John. John refers to himself as the disciple Jesus loved. Why did, why did they say that? I'd love to. There's so many rabbit trails. I think we could go down this morning. I'd be really disciplined to not do that. Uh, but perhaps part of it, there's a deeper meaning, but perhaps part of it is some sense of them really trying to make sure Jesus gets the message. It's kind of like saying, hey, you know, Lazarus is sick. Remember? You love him, so, you know, it's like leaving it there, really trying to urge Jesus to come and do something about their uh, brother, Lazarus, that's quite sick. So in verse 4, but when Jesus heard it, he said uh, this to his disciples, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God, that is himself, may be glorified through it. 
So at first, he's not quite going along with the sense of urgency that they're trying to convey here. It almost sounds like Jesus is going, no, nah, he'll be all right. He's okay. And in our household, that's kind of how generally that's the kind of thing I would say, you know, if the kids are sick or Benjamin has fallen or something. Chris is like, should we go to the doctor? Like, should we do something? Like, nah, man, he'll be fine. So it kind of sounds like that's what Jesus is saying, but it's a little more cryptic than that. Jesus is saying that he's not going to do anything about his sick friend that he loves because somehow he will be glorified if he does not go and help his friend, which sounds like, just kind of from a, from a human perspective, that sounds a little self-centered, doesn't it? I won't go and help him because somehow attention's gonna be on me. And, and I want us to kind of enter into that because this is gonna be really important. So just hold on to that. Jesus is saying his attention is gonna be drawn to himself. So hold on to it. I'm gonna pass judgment on it just yet, but it's gonna be important. Then verse five. It confirms, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now verse five and verse six don't seem to correlate with each other. You would think that when it says that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so therefore when he heard Lazarus was sick, he ran to Bethany as fast as his legs could carry him. That's what you would expect. But it says Jesus loved him when he heard he was healed. He stayed right where he was for two days longer. Generally, you would demonstrate your love for somebody or your close friendship for somebody, kind of with this sort of paradigm, think about it, if you had to describe like one of your best, closest friends, you would describe them as somebody that if you were in trouble, you could call them up in the middle of the night and you know they would drop everything and come to you, am I right? You would describe your best friend like that. That would seem to be appropriate. If you really love somebody, you would drop everything and go to them, but Jesus is deliberately not doing that. And so again, there's something mysterious going on here that we really need to get a hold of this morning. Jesus is deliberately delaying going to his sick friend, or we know he's because somehow he will be glorified. He will reveal some of his glory through the delayed response to his sick friend. Let's pick up the story in verse seven. So then after this, so after the two days had passed, he said to his disciples, now let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And so you can see as Jesus announces to his disciples, it's time to go to Bethany, the disciples are afraid. So they had kind of secretly been glad when Jesus delayed going to Judea because Bethany is super close to Jerusalem, just a couple of kilometers outside the city of Jerusalem. Jesus had been there. There was already a lot of heat, a lot of tension. The Jewish religious leaders were trying to kill Jesus. They'd got away from there to escape that. And so they were like, why do you want to go back there? These guys were just about to kill you. So they're a little bit relieved that they had hung on and are not too keen to get going to Bethany. And Jesus responds with that passage about walking in light and not darkness, which I spoke about at the sunrise service this morning. Moving on, verse 11. So after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. So the disciples said to him, but Lord, if he's fallen asleep, then he will recover. So they think Jesus, you know, speaking about oh, he's sick and he'll get better or he's taking a nap. So now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in his sleep. So at this point now, Jesus declares that Lazarus 
is not only sick, but he has now died. Which he knew all along. He knew that, that Lazarus was going to die. Now, spoiler alert. I'm gonna just pretend for my own sake that nobody here knows this story. Just play along with me a little bit. I had like wanted to hold back on this news for as long as I could in the sermon, but I feel like it's important right now that you know how the story is going to end. It's going to end by Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Gasp. Yes. Thank you. And that is how he's going to reveal some of his glory through the sickness. That's why he would delay Lazarus to being dead. But the question still is, why did Jesus wait two days when he heard that Lazarus was sick and then he knew that he was going to die? You can map the timeline of the story out pretty accurately. I told you the three to four day journey. If Jesus had responded right away to go to Mary and Martha, like by the time he got there, Lazarus would have already been dead. And so he could have still raised Lazarus from the, from the dead. He could have still done what he was going to do. Why did he wait two extra days? Why put Mary and Martha through two extra days of grieving? And the short answer to that question is that in those times, before we were able to uh, preserve bodies that had died, uh, you had to bury somebody within 24 hours of their death. So before they started to decompose, there were all sorts of health risks attached. So you kind of, you had to just rush them off to the tomb within 24 hours. You couple that with the fact that there wasn't like, you know, good medical attention close by and what kind of often happened is that somebody would die, they'd put them away in a coffin, take them away to the tomb, and hear this knocking sound on the coffin. Turns out the guy was not dead. His kind of heart was just infibrillating or whatever that technical term is, or like his breathing had slowed, but he's like wasn't dead and knocking thing, and hey, and that comes out and he's alive. So if Jesus had gone there within the kind of that two-day period and then raised Lazarus, everyone would be, oh yeah, we know how this one goes. We saw that last week, my uncle, we thought he was dead too, and he just knocked on that thing. And so he stayed an extra two days so that we know that Lazarus was dead. And this comes up later in the story that when they roll away the tomb, Martha says, Jesus, don't go in there. Lazarus has been dead four days. And she says, uh, there's an odor. And the King James Version puts this nicely. It says, it stinketh <laughs> because he's like he's, he's really, really dead and has, and has started decomposing. And so that's why he waits the extra time. But Mary and Martha don't know this. And I think this, I'd love to go on this tangent another day. But Jesus delays on purpose, which I think for us there is a lesson in that, how quite often God delays his work in our life for, for particular reasons that works out better for his glory and for our good. We're often, as adults, can be like three-year-olds who the idea of delayed gratification just does not sync with us. It's now, now, now. And so they're, being, they're journeying through this. They have, to, they have to wait. They don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Okay, verse 14. Then Jesus told them plainly, his disciples now, um, still with them in Batania. Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But now let us go to him. So again now is this mysterious attitude of Jesus. I'm glad Lazarus has died. I'm glad that I wasn't there so that you may believe. Which again is strange. Jesus is saying he's glad that his friend Lazarus has died. Now we know he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead because I gave you the spoiler. But in the story, you're not meant to know that yet. So just hold on to this. All you know is that somehow the death of Lazarus, which Jesus deliberately made sure that that would happen, somehow that death would lead to the Son of Man, him revealing his glory so that people would believe Next important piece of information about why this is happening, so that they may believe. 
And then verse 16, as we finish this first act in this story, I've divided it into three acts. This first act is a delay that leads to death. And so the last part of that story, we come to Thomas, the disciple. If you've been a Christian for a while, you know, Thomas, he's the, he's the melancholic one. So truly formed. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. With a big sigh, I would imagine. Okay, so that's act one. Lazarus has died. Act two, so a delay that leads to death. Act two, a death that leads to life. So reading from verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, remember, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. So now he's in Bethany, not quite in the village, he's outside. A lot of the, we read the Jews had come to grieve with Mary and Martha, just by the way, they weren't all there to grieve with Mary and Martha to show support. We read later that a lot of them that had come from Jerusalem were hoping Jesus would come because they want to kill Jesus. And in the timeline of the whole crucifixion story, this takes place about a week before the crucifixion of Jesus. He'll stay at their house and the whole events of the Passion Week will start. In other words, it's this story that catapults Jesus to Jerusalem and to the cross and ultimately to his death. So verse 21, he meets Martha. Here are Martha's first words. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And you listen to Martha's words. On the one hand, there's something positive about it because she believes Jesus could have done something. If you were here, you wouldn't have died. You would have done something. So she believes something about Jesus. But part of it, I can't help but think, is a little bit of a, passive aggressive kind of rebuke like why weren't you here you know we sent for you ages ago and if you were here this would not have happened to us so jesus answers her in verse 23 jesus said to her martha your brother will rise again so martha said to him now, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So Martha's a well-trained disciple of Jesus. Jewish background, so she would have believed if she was part of the more Pharisee training, not the Sadducee training, she would have believed in a resurrection at the end of the age. She had been around Jesus. Remember, she was in the kitchen, and she would have overheard Jesus teaching things to Mary and along the way. So she knows. She believes in this idea that at the end, there will be a resurrection of everybody who's died will come back to life for a for a form of, of judgment, which tells you, by the way, as she proclaims this, yeah, I know that on that day, tells you she didn't really expect Jesus to bring Lazarus back from the dead, hey? Because when Jesus says he'll rise again, she's thinking, yeah, yeah, that day. She's not, she's not thinking today. And then come these, some of the most important lines in the whole Bible. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus now, after those awkward references to how he's trying to draw attention to himself, is now unmistakably, unashamedly turning Martha's attention to himself. So he's getting closer to the moment where he's going to reveal his glory so that belief will happen. But you still got to wonder at Jesus' tactic here. 
And he has Martha, she's grieving. There's tons of people around grieving. And like Jesus is using this as a teaching moment to turn attention to himself. You think like, man, you can maybe deal with it later. Here are these grieving people. But this is exactly the point. And so we have to camp out here this morning. I really just have one major thing that I want to express perhaps to you. Here's one of them. Jesus is provoking a profound shift in Martha's understanding and in our understanding. See, Martha believes that there's a, a resurrection from the dead, but that it as, is an event that happens in the future. And she knows that somehow Jesus is the one that enables that future event to take place which is true. Jesus is the one who unlocks the potential for bodily resurrection. That, that is actually why Resurrection Sunday is such a big deal. You think about Good Friday, we know that that is when the sin of the world was transferred onto Jesus and he paid by his blood and by his death and he paid the justice that was required and then he died. But you've got to think, well, that sacrifice was made. Why did he need to be resurrected? Part of the answer, the central answer, is to show us that that dead debt was definitively paid. If Jesus had stayed dead, one could always wonder, well, did he actually pay for all of sin? But because he raised, uh, was raised from the dead, it's God saying, it is finished. Justice has been satisfied. I said it like this in the eight o'clock service, and as I said it, I thought it's sacrilegious, but I haven't thought of a better metaphor between then and now, so I'll say it to you anyway. It's kind of like when you're at the toll, and you're paying for something, and then you get, you know, you tap the credit card, bloop, and then you get the ring on your phone, bloop, bloop, it has been paid. That message is the, the final declaration that, yes, the transaction has happened. It's done. The resurrection of Jesus is kind of the blip blip on the phone. As I'm saying it again, that's a terrible way to explain it. But you get what I mean. The resurrection is this idea that it is finished. It is God going. It's done. So yes, Jesus enables resurrection with, with, without that, without us knowing the debt was paid. There was no chance of us being resurrected. And Jesus is resurrection displays to us our trajectory that we'll die and we too will be resurrected once again so so yes martha yes jesus does enable this future event known as resurrection to take place but what jesus is doing in this story which is why it's so crucial for us as Christians today and especially for us to talk about on Resurrection Sunday is he is trying to move her thinking away from resurrection as an event to resurrection as a person himself. Resurrection is not just an event that's going to take place. I am the resurrection. Jesus says, remember, it's this whole thing of turning attention to himself. Now, here's why this is really important for us. Often what you'll find in the history of church and in kind of gospel preaching where we as preachers are really trying to motivate people to put their belief in Jesus, uh, we will, you know, we'll say things like, you know, come to Jesus because in Jesus you will have eternal life and so we'll talk about eternity we'll talk about eternity in hell and it's uncomfortable you know we'll use stronger language than that and then we'll talk about eternal life as this kind of paradise sort of existence and say so so come to Jesus because then you too will have this eternal resurrection life which is great it's a great tactic I mean I should try that because honestly who wouldn't want that I mean truthfully 
Like this idea of my life, it seems so limited. Is this all there is to life? No, it's, it's eternal. It goes on forever. And hey, by the way, you can spend that forever eternal existence in this paradise-like place where the, you know, the streets are paved with gold and there's, like, there's no grieving, there's no sadness, and it's just all beautiful. It's just like sunrise and we feast all day and we'll never get fat. And it's just like this beautiful, wonderful you know, existence. Like who's not going to want that? Even the most hardened atheists, I think, on their deathbed, you go, hey, do you know that this isn't the end, there's an eternity, and if you just like, believe in Jesus, he will enable, he will unlock this beautiful, you know, post-earthly life existence that's wonderful. Most people would take that. See, in, this, in that version of the gospel, tragically, Jesus becomes a means to an end. But Jesus is not a means to an end. Jesus is the end. I am the resurrection. I am the life. Jesus is not a way to get yourself resurrected. He is the resurrection. Do you see what's happening here? No, good. Got more for you. So let's push a little harder here. Jesus did not die to get you to heaven. Jesus died to get you to God. He died to get you to God. That's the whole gospel, to reconcile sinful humanity to God. God who is holy and righteous and exists in this Trinitarian community, which is an eternal eternal community and so yes when you're reconciled to God through Jesus you're included in this eternal trinitarian community so it includes eternal life but the whole point of eternity is not a paradise like existence forever it's God what heaven looks like is this glory of God being present that's what's so beautiful about it He didn't come and die and resurrected just so that we could receive an all expenses paid trip to some paradise like eternity. Pastor John Piper asked this question, which it stuck, it stuck with me forever. Such an important question. If you could have all of heaven with all of its luxuries and pleasures, and absence of grief. If you could have all of heaven, but Jesus was not there, would you still be satisfied? That's a very important question. Because we kind of got to go, uh, y yes, hey, if we're honest, yeah, that sounds great, but see, if you answer yes, then you don't truly understand the nature of eternal life and don't truly understand the glory and magnificence of Jesus Christ. Because he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And so we had to get through these awkward passages of him turning attention to himself because the greatest gift anyone could ever receive is not just a stamped, punched ticket to eternity, but God himself, Jesus Christ himself. And so now, as he's explained all of that in that one sentence, he tells the Martha what the appropriate response to that is. The whole point. So he's turned attention to himself. He's going to reveal his glory. And the appropriate response is belief. Some homework for you all. Go back in this passage and count how many times the word belief comes up. It's the point. Three times in these two verses. That's the point. In light of this, what do we do? Believe. Believe. Believe in Jesus. That's what he says to Martha. Do you believe this? And in verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. 
So she gets it. That's the end of Act 2, Act 3. A life that leads to belief. I'm going to run quite quickly through this last act, and there's just one important point that we need to focus on. So verse 28, when Martha had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she rose quickly and went to Jesus. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, was still in the place where Martha had met him, so out on the road. When the Jews who were with Mary in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. And now she meets Jesus. What are Mary's first words to Jesus? Well, it has a familiar ring to it. Verse 32, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Exact same words. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? I said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. Some of them said, could, he not, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? This again is so curious and strange. Just have to touch on it just a little bit. Why is Jesus grieving? He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Like he should be like, y'all, just wait. You hang on now. You see something special? Should be, you know, why is he like that strange? And, and then the clue is, it's kind of a bit of a, travesty of translation here when it says deeply moved in spirit what it literally means what it always means every single time is outraged he's livid with anger he's like shaking with rage you go okay well that's even more mysterious why is he angry he's angry at the jews why is he so mad he's angry at death because of the destruction that death brings in people's lives i feel like it's important for you to know Sometimes Christians just go, yeah, but, you know, they're with the Lord, and we, we kind of, no, 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 that Jesus is angry at death because of the grief it brings. Some of you felt that, and he knows that. And death is the result of sin in the world, and when a holy, righteous, the perfection of humanity faces pure evil like death, he's going to be outraged. We're seeing his holiness on display, actually. In verse 38, so now, now comes the moment we've all been waiting for. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, i.e. stalled, shaking with anger, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, hey, Lord, by this time there will be a stinketh, for he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to which just by the way just shows you again Martha actually doesn't know what's going to happen as much as she said Jesus could do something she actually is not expecting that to happen Jesus said to her did I not tell you this is the second important thing that I want to get so just hang on to this did I not tell you Martha that if you believed you would see the glory of God that's really important. That's why we had to do this entire passage. Because if you're following along, what he had said before to the disciples is, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to do a miracle. I'm going to reveal my glory so that you will believe. But what he's saying now is you've got to, it's the other way around. First you believe, then you will see. And this is really important for us to just dwell on for a little bit because the whole point of this message, the whole point of Jesus and this whole story, this whole interaction is to elicit belief, is to point people to believing. That's exactly what I'm trying to do this morning. And some people maybe are waiting for the miracle to happen, are waiting for God to show that he really is. They're waiting for proof and then they will believe. But yeah, Jesus is going, no, 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 it's the other way around. First you believe and then you will see which I've got to tell you, 
is almost always how it goes in the Christian life. I can't say always. Some people have supernatural experiences and they then believe that it was the case for Martha. But I'm convinced and can say with some authority that this is what we're supposed to expect. Believe first. And then you will see. And I can say that because remember, Just at the end of this whole story, when Jesus is resurrected, Easter Sunday, yay, gets to Thomas. Remember, Thomas, that guy, Thomas doesn't believe he's alive. He sees Jesus, touches him, goes, whoa, it is true. What does Jesus say to Thomas? Well, we have those words in John 20, verse 29. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's the final word from Jesus on belief. It's blessed are those, that's us, who have not seen yet believed. Okay, so they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I'm saying this out loud on account of the people standing around so that... They may believe that you sent me, add that to your tally. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. That's it. No fanfare, no angels, no worship team getting the mood right and the the singers in the background building to this epic moment, just three words, Lazarus, come out. I heard somebody say, and it's kind of funny, but I think true too, that if Jesus had not been so particular about who he was referring to, if he had just said, come out, everyone in all the graves of the hillside would have popped out, right? But he specifically says, hey, uh, Lazarus, you come out. Which by the way, when he was you know, resurrected, just, just remember that, um, on, on the cross, and the tombs all popped open because of this resurrection energy. Lazarus, come out. And then we read, I lost this, then the man who had died. While he came out and his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. That's a funny sight. We're meant to pay attention to that detail. Looks like a mummy, literally. He's bound with linen strips and his face is covered with a cloth. He's like, Oaks, I can't see. Help me out, here. And so Jesus goes, unbind him and let him go. End of that story. But fast forward to today, and I'm going to to close on this. Fast forward to today, Resurrection Sunday. Jesus' resurrection. And Lazarus, it seems quite similar, hey? There's a hole in the mountain. There's a rock over the hole, and inside of that is a dead man. But out would come a man that's no longer dead. Seems so similar, but Jesus' resurrection was in no way like Lazarus's. For one thing, Jesus called Lazarus out. Lazarus, come out. No one called Jesus out. Right? He is God. There was no other God person. He is God. He just walked out. Lazarus did not walk out surrounded by glory. I mean, Jesus you know, has the stone moved for him by an angel. There's angels at like the exit to this tomb, Jesus kind of comes out, whereas Lazarus kind of waddles out and he's still strapped in these linen clothing and his face is wrapped. And you remember even the story of Jesus, a little detail when Peter and John run to the tomb and they look inside the tomb, what do they see? Well, it's empty, but they see specifically the linen clothes folded up all neatly. I mean, the Bible literally tells us that story for a reason. It tells you Jesus is a great house guest. So invite him over, he'll always fold up his linen before he leaves. But there's this, this Lazarus story and this Jesus story could not be more different. And in fact, Lazarus ultimately dies. Again, Jesus doesn't. He ascends into heaven where he now sits at the right hand of God to what? To intercede for us. So on Resurrection Sunday, when we see Jesus validating his claim to be the resurrection and the life. That's what we see today. Really, there's just one question. It's the same question he asked Martha. It's the same thing he told his disciples, the whole purpose. Do you believe 
this. It's quite simple. And it's a question we've got to be asked all through our Christian journey. For some of you, maybe it's the first time you're going to answer, yes, Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Most of us have answered that question, but let me tell you, the Christian life never really moves on from this question of do you believe, do you believe despite your circumstances, do you believe despite what's going on, do you believe despite your doubts, do you believe? We, never, we constantly say, Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I believe in you. Amen? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that as we allow this to settle into our hearts and minds. You are the one who ultimately turns our attention to Jesus Christ and glorifies him in our eyes. So would you do that today? Perhaps for some who for the first time will find Jesus to be the glorious one, the king, and believe in him. And for the rest of us, perhaps who have strayed or perhaps who are clouded by doubts or circumstances or just feel distant, that you would awaken in our hearts to that we would all respond, yes, Jesus, we believe in you. You are the Christ, our Savior, the Son of God, God himself, and we worship you and praise you. Amen. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Rosebank Union Church. If you've enjoyed this message, please feel free to share it with others. And if you would like to support the work of Rosebank Union Church, please visit the giving link on our website at ruc.org.za.